Welcome, everyone. This is Laurel Miller from International Crisis Group, and we're about to begin. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Apologies for the short delay. Uh, we, like others, are experimenting with Twitter spaces, and experimentation always has a little bit of a trial and error aspect to it. So here we go. Um, as I said, I'm Laurel Miller. I'm director of the Asia program at the International Crisis Group. Um, today, I have with me Graham Smith, who is a senior consultant for Crisis Group, uh, working on Afghanistan, and Ibrahim Bahis, who is an analyst for Afghanistan uh, with us at International Crisis Group. For those of you who don't know, uh, we are a conflict prevention and conflict resolution focused uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, we conduct our work through research, analysis, and advocacy aimed at uh, improving policies related to uh, conflict, uh, conflict prevention and conflict resolution. Uh, we work globally, uh, headquartered in Brussels, Belgium, uh, but we're a global organization and we've been doing work in Afghanistan for um, more than 20 years now. Uh, we have a new report that was published just last Friday that some of you may be interested in uh, titled Afghanistan's Security Challenges Under the Taliban taking a comprehensive look at how the security landscape has evolved in Afghanistan over the last year and what the challenges are ahead for the Afghan people, uh, for the authorities in Afghanistan, uh, for the international community that is interested in uh, how the situation in Afghanistan evolves. Um, I'm going to start us off by uh, having both Graham and Ibrahim uh, make some short remarks and then we will open it up for questions. A reminder, please submit your questions um, through DM, through direct message to at crisis group um, and then they will be fed to us here. If you do not want to have um, your name identified in association with your question, uh, please feel free to let us know that. Otherwise, uh, I am likely to indicate who it is that is posing the question. But if you don't want your name mentioned, um, that's no problem. Just be sure to let us know. Uh, people are going to remain muted. Uh, listeners are going to remain muted throughout the, the Twitter space, but we will get to as many questions as we possibly can uh, during the approximately hour that we have. Um, now over to you, Graham, uh, with some opening comments. Sure, thanks. Um, it's a kind of a, a mind-boggling challenge to try to sum up the situation in an entire uh, country um, and sort of audacious, really, for, you know, a, a white guy like me sitting outside Afghanistan to try to sum up all the concerns, um, you know, related to that country. And I, you know, I, I think that a lot of the, I've been, you know, working on Afghanistan since 2005. And there have been a lot of really um, intense discussions amongst internationals, especially amongst Westerners, about sort of what do we do next on Afghanistan and where do we go from here? And I think it's worth reflecting that on the fact that, um, you know, these policy discussions and debates that we have amongst ourselves now um, are in some ways uh, a little bit less consequential, you know, than they used to be when there were more than 100,000 international forces on the ground. Um, you know, some of the really big conversations are now happening, you know, amongst Afghans um, in Dari and Pashto or, uh, you know, between uh, the de facto Taliban authorities and, uh, you know, interlocutors are whom their conversations translated, um, you know, uh, into regional languages. And so it's, um, you know, the, the, the debates that we have uh, here amongst ourselves, you know, uh, in sort of Western policy spaces, are a little bit less um, life or death than they used to be, but still, um, I think it's very important that um, that we've just come out with this uh, paper on security. I think taking a, a kind of um, tour d'horizon, um, you know, a kind of a, a sweeping look at the security landscape in a way that really I haven't seen anywhere else. Um, and I think that's very important because you know there is a risk that. Um, Westerners might fall back onto bad habits of uh, bombing Afghanistan or funding militias and hoping that that would uh, sort of fix the security problems. Um, so, you know, I, I, I hope that we have humbly presented a few policy alternatives uh, for the consideration of, of, of policymakers and for the consideration of the Taliban. 
Um, and that followed uh, some report, some work that we did, um, you know, through the, the first half of uh, the year uh, on the advocacy side and, and uh, last year uh, publishing a report on the um, humanitarian and uh, economic picture that I think did um, have some influence. Um, you know, uh, we were arguing that uh, the West in particular, but the, the world generally, should help with an economic revival in Afghanistan. Um, that it's not going to be enough just to dump bags of food into the country, that really uh, some more fundamental work needs to be done uh, to assist with getting the country back on its feet economically. Um, and I think that that work is still unfinished, which is why we'll probably do uh, an update coming soon on the uh, humanitarian and, and economic picture. Um, and then I think uh, also regionally, we, with, with a bit of luck in the coming months, uh, Ibrahim and I uh, might be able to do uh, some more uh, analysis of um, Afghanistan's relationship with the region, because I think, uh, especially after the, the death of the Al-Qaeda leader Zawahiri in Kabul, um, you're likely to see more and more divergence between regional and international approaches. Um, and so that uh, is maybe a, a topic for, for further research. But anyways, I, I, I feel tremendously lucky in, in this work um, to be uh, working with Ibrahim Bahis, my colleague, uh, who sweats it out on the ground and does, you know, a lot of our, uh, you know, work uh, you know, primarily uh, inside Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, it's really his impressions from the ground that, that inform us uh, day to day. And so maybe we should hand over to him and, and um, you know, hear what he's thinking and feeling as we approach this one year anniversary. Thanks, Ibrahim. Over to you. And just a reminder to everyone, we're starting to get some questions via uh, direct message and people should feel free to begin to send in their questions uh, via DM to at Crisis Group. Ibrahim, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Laurel, and thanks for the great summary, uh, uh, both uh, Laurel and Graham. Uh, let me, <clears throat> Crisis Group has kind of reestablished its presence in Afghanistan. Graham and I made uh, several trips to Afghanistan where, in addition to Kabul, we have managed to travel to other parts of the country, uh, specifically the south and north, and we will continue to visit different parts of the country to gather what people are thinking and seeing and saying about the developments. Uh, we also have a number of researchers employed in different parts of the country who are helping us uh, f form a more wholesome picture of the country uh, based on kind of our impressions, our conversations with uh, people, Afghans on the ground, as well as what we are hearing through our researchers and uh, uh, our interlocutors. Let me try to kind of talk about some of the changes that I've witnessed in Afghanistan since the Taliban took over uh, um, a year ago, today, a year ago. Uh, some of the changes have been, uh, some of the big kind of political changes that come to mind are Afghanistan has gone through a tremendous uh, change in terms of a new political class has emerged. The Taliban are now the rulers of Afghanistan. And as a movement who had uh, tens of thousands or uh, perhaps uh, even more than that when you count uh, supporters, they have really overtaken the state machinery in the country and are now in full control of the government machinery in Afghanistan. Uh, the old pickle class has, uh, some of them uh, fearful uh, of their lives, have left the country. Others are still in country, but uh, don't really ha haven't really been given any role by the Taliban in the new uh, governance of the country. And some, there's a large segment of the civil servants that continue to uh, stay in country and uh, work in the government positions that they held before the Taliban took over. Another big change uh, that I've noticed is in the media and specifically criticism of the government. Under the old republic, there was a lot of freedom for people to be able to criticize the government, the, the performance of whether it was the president, the parliament or any government organ. Uh, under the Taliban, we have seen a lot of the criticism become more and more muted over time. A and largely from what we can gather, it's because of the Taliban's uh, uh, repression of criticism and, and the way they view criticism. Uh, now, it's not to say that there is no criticism of the Taliban, but they have really uh, they've adopted an approach of kind of differentiating between criticism. Some is seen as constructive, which is allowed, and others is seen as destructive, which is uh, then uh, people who do employ those criticisms are uh, uh, imprisoned or uh, otherwise uh, uh, 
admonished. And I think the line is very blurry and it's very difficult for people to know when they will cross the line. And it, it's created a lot of fear in the public conversations you're hearing in the media when it comes to people who want to say things whether it's uh, criticism, whether it's offering solutions, whether it's uh, venting their frustration, but there's a lot of fear in terms of specifically when it comes to the media and being able to voice their uh, opinions. Uh, another important change has been in the gender sphere, uh, specifically with women. Uh, we have seen uh, women in Afghanistan uh, continue to face uh, quite draconian restrictions in some cases. Uh, secondary schools in, uh, officially remain closed, although there are secondary schools for females, uh, I should add, uh, in some provinces. But by and large, the Taliban have not implemented uh, uh, the promise they made uh, early this year that they will reopen girls' secondary schooling. Uh, in addition to that, females are, uh, especially those that used to work in the government sector, are uh, many of them are unable to return to work. There are females in the health and education uh, sectors, as well as in some uh, portfolios in the uh, Ministry of Interior, but by and large, women have been excluded and are unable to return to their jobs. In the private sector, uh, females are working, but they're facing, continue to face uh, uh, both persecution as laws that inhibit the ability to carry out activities uh, females uh, find it difficult to travel long distances because the Taliban have a decree requiring that they be accompanied by a male uh, relative when they're traveling uh, long distances. Uh, and, and when we speak to a lot of the women on the ground, there is a lot of fear, not just the Taliban, but the change, the political change has brought about a change of thinking within the families themselves. Male relatives are often telling females that it's far too dangerous for them to be out and working. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the economic situation has really created a crunch on the uh, economy and people are a lot of the employers prefer males because they are fearful that if they have female workforce there would be additional restrictions imposed by the de facto authorities which would make it difficult and economically unviable uh, uh, not viable for them to be able to employ female workforce so it, it has created a lot of challenges for them as well lastly let me end by speaking a bit about uh, some of the common themes we hear from uh, we've heard from afghans over the past few months have, as we have spoken to uh, afghans both in kabul as well as the provinces um, many afghans uh, appreciate the the new security uh, landscape in the country now afghanistan is uh, far from violence free there is still con residual violence but as our report highlights it's quite uh, it's reduced significantly when we compare it to what was happening last year when Afghanistan was the world's deadliest conflict. And many people who last year would tell you stories of having their children or their uh, family members hiding in basements because of their house was getting fired upon either by the uh, Taliban uh, uh, insurgents or by the security forces are now able to till their farms and look after uh, some of the more mundane tasks of their lives. Uh, at the same time, I think a big concern with many ordinary Afghans is which way the country's relations with the international community is going. And I think in part that's to do with the economic uh, strangulation of the country. Many people that you speak with, uh, in addition to the famine drought that has impacted many farmers, you, uh, when you speak with people who had businesses complain to you that the customer base has shrunk to you know, in some cases, 10% or 5% of what it was before the Taliban takeover, there just isn't a lot of purchasing power. And as a result, all the businesses are feeling the shockwaves of this. And many are, want to know whether this government will be able to accommodate the demands of the international community for relations to normalize so that the economy can come back to a level of stability and they can go on with their lives. I think these are some of uh, the impressions I've picked up. Uh, let me end there and hand it back to you, Laura. Thank you both. Uh, great introduction. I think you've both pointed to uh, some important changes in the security picture in Afghanistan over the last year, uh, in uh, people's experience in society and the imposition of greater social uh, controls by the authorities and the dramatic deterioration of the economic and humanitarian picture in the country. We've got some good questions that have come in. Again, these can be sent by DM to at crisis group. Uh, but I'm going to exercise the moderator's prerogative of posing the first question, which is, uh, with all of the changes that you have both pointed to, some of which uh, quite rapidly and dramatically <clears throat> in the early days of the last year, uh, I'm also struck by one 
uh, one dimension of the situation in Afghanistan that seems to have evolved remarkably slowly over the last year, and that is the political evolution in the country. I mean, it's, it's a whole year later. Um, there is still an interim government in place. Uh, it is still fairly opaque how decision-making uh, is conducted by the new authorities. And it's also unclear still, um, I think, but I'm interested in both of your views on this, what the political direction is of the country. Do we know anything more today than we did a year ago about the trajectory of Afghanistan's political evolution? I mean, is the kind of regime that there is in place now what we're going to see uh, indefinitely? Is there any kind of political ferment that you see there within the Taliban authorities? Graham, do you want to take that first? And then Ibrahim, if you have anything to add? Yeah, sure. And probably as usual, Ibrahim will have more useful things to say, but maybe I'll just interject briefly. Um, I think I, I saw that we had some people on the line here uh, whose names I, I recognize from Doha. Um, and certainly some of the friends I made, um, you know, in Qatar during the peace talks, if you can call it uh, peace talks. Um, you know, some of those uh, people, I think, had been uh, hopeful that despite the Taliban's military takeover last August, that there might still be space for uh, political dialogue um, that might even, you know, pick up some of the threads uh, from Doha and uh, work towards some form of um, national reconciliation. Um, you know, there were certainly people in the U.S. government who were hoping that, um, there was even uh, a sort of a concept paper produced by a think tank in Kabul that's associated with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that has uh, sort of floated this idea of, of national reconciliation. And um, there have, has been, you know, some form of outreach by um, uh, a reconciliation commission under Dilawar, a senior Taliban figure, um, that has been reaching out, you know, individually to um, sometimes very prominent uh, people who were associated with the, the, the previous uh, Afghan political dispensation, um, you know, senior figures uh, in the former republic, uh, and asking them to, to sort of come in from the cold, as it were, to, to you know, come back to Afghanistan physically and um, either uh, participate in, in the new order or at least to, to not be hostile to the new order. Um, I, I think that uh, process has been a lot more quiet and piecemeal um, than uh, some folks would have liked. Um, I was in Oslo earlier this year when um, the Taliban made their first sort of um, foray into Europe um, you know, under their new regime. Um, and some of the um, people who were uh, sitting across the table from them, members of, of Afghan civil society, Afghan politicians, had been sort of hoping that that might kick off a kind of a, a new bond or a, uh, some form of, you know, high level, um, you know, dialogue um, with the Taliban about how they might include people who disagree with them into the new uh, political dispensation. And I don't think uh, the Taliban had the same idea. Um, I think their idea of, um, of reconciliation involves uh, other people kind of surrendering to them, as it were, rather than uh, the Taliban surrendering any meaningful share of power. Um, you know, that being said, um, you know, it's probably good that the Taliban uh, would prefer to uh, shake hands with their enemies uh, rather than slaughtering. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't see, uh, you know, in the near term horizon, any sort of fundamental reordering of the, uh, uh, you know, of, of the sort of Taliban share of power. But I don't, I'm, Ibrahim, I'd be curious about your thoughts on this, though. Yeah, I mean, in particular, Ibrahim, is there anything we know today uh, that's new, different, uh, more detailed about the political trajectory of Afghanistan or the Taliban that we didn't know a year ago? Uh, let me come back to that question uh, as I uh, add to what uh, some of the excellent comments Graham made. Uh, I, I think for many Afghans, the Taliban's one-year rule has been marked by uh, disappointment with the broken promises that the Taliban made over the past two decades. Uh, the Taliban 
for years, over a decade, promised that they do not seek monopoly of power in Afghanistan. And since the Doha negotiation process started, they talked about forming an inclusive government. Uh, instead, what we saw the Taliban do is appoint their own stalwarts to positions of almost every position of importance and frame that uh, and try to frame that as some kind of an inclusive government because these people included eth ethnicities, uh, including Tajiks and Uzbeks. Uh, notably, has, there are no ministers, uh, Hazara ministers, although there are uh, uh, at least two Hazara deputy ministers in the government. Another uh, uh, decision or, or broken promise that has been uh, uh, aroused a lot of uh, anger and frustration amongst Afghans has been uh, with regards to female rights, especially uh, uh, girls' uh, right to, or women's rights to education. Uh, what has made these uh, even worse is the Taliban's uh, lack of willingness or capacity to explain these decisions to the Afghan people. We have seen more recently the Taliban attempting to explain these uh, decisions, sometimes referring to, uh, for example, we've heard that it's because of cultural sensitivities that girls' secondary schools remain closed for now, uh, that there's cultural opposition. Other times it's framed as a religious uh, uh, reservations of religious scholars that need to be overcome. Uh, but by and large, decisions remain very op opaque and indiscernible for many ordinary Afghans. Um, in, uh, just speaking in terms of the interim government, you mentioned the Taliban have formed an interim government and one year on it's still very unclear. I think it's a bit of uh, trying to have both their cake and eat it in the sense that they want to have a government that's controlled by them uh, and, and that's fully within their uh, they, uh, they have the capacity to make whatever decision they want. And for, I think from the Taliban's perspective, that means monopolizing the whole government machinery, but at the same time, not antagonizing the international community uh, by forming a, a permanent government that's composed completely of the Taliban. And I think that might be one of the reasons why they've gone towards the interim uh, framework. Another possible reason is also that the Taliban never really reached census on many of these fundamental decisions. The Taliban for two decades was so busy fighting an insurgency, uh, they never really got together and thought about some of the more fundamentals of what a future government should look like, what are the key principles. And, and only during the Doha talks, I think this process began. And it was very slow and tedious because for the Taliban, they needed to ensure enough buy-in for it to be uh, so that it doesn't kind of challenge the cohesion of the movement. And the, the rapid military advance of the Taliban overtook the events, the, the kind of the, the discussions they were having. And I think they're still in that space where there's a lack of consensus within the Taliban on the direction. And uh, with the lawyer Jirga, I think there was some kind of hope that the Taliban would be able to build a level of consensus. And there was rumors they might announce a permanent government, very much the same government being uh, turned into a permanent one. But I think opposition and differences of opinion within the Taliban uh, meant even that was not, uh, um, th that didn't eventuate Looking at the future and coming more specifically to the question you posed, Laura, uh, I think it's, there's a level of fear. The Taliban are very much have come to the conclusion that this is the type of government they want. They want an emirate. They want their white flag to be the national flag. They want the government machinery to be controlled by Taliban stalwarts because they, they, they want to uh, appease their own members and commanders. And, and there's a fear amongst them that people could uh, 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 defect from the movement and join some of the challenges to the current government, including uh, the Islamic State's Khurasan province. Uh, and I think that's meant that uh, th th they want to have that monopoly over power. But at the same time, they're fearful that if they announce this as a permanent composition, it will cement their isolation and turn them into the type of pariah state in the 1990s. And I think they 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 uh, they, they do not want to return to that state. Uh, another, uh, lastly, I'll just add that uh, I think the, the, the key challenge for the Taliban from ordinary Afghan's perspective is the inability to address challenges, whether it's political dissent. I think the Taliban really need to move from the idea that all dissent or, or all criticism of their government doesn't equate to opposition and, and, and uh, they do not need to or should suppress all forms of opposition. That's the kind of modest operandi we're seeing. And I think for the Taliban to evolve and go to things like constitutionalism and having a kind of judicial framework and, uh, with rights and responsibilities enshrined, they really need to move away from this paranoia that their government is being undermined by uh, foreigners and uh, that any form of criticism to their governance is uh, uh, an attempt to uh, uh, undermine it and uh, uh, make it short-lived. 
Thanks, Ibrahim. Uh, one of our listeners, um, Michelle Gehrig, picked up on the comment you made earlier about constructive criticism being allowed and asked uh, if there are any examples of this type of criticism and Taliban reactions to them. I'm wondering, in light of what you just said, you know, is it more that a certain amount of constructive criticism is allowed uh, or a certain amount of criticism is allowed if it's not too, um, too strong simply for enabling some venting uh, of, uh, of grievances? Or um, is there actually a dynamic of certain types of criticism being seriously considered and reacted to? Uh, perhaps I was being a bit too harsh on the Taliban when I, uh, when I made those comments. Perhaps I was not. But uh, uh, the, the reason I say this constructive criticism is because when you look at the Afghan media, local media, uh, a lot of the time you will have uh, someone who supports the Taliban or an official of the Taliban, but you would have someone who's, uh, um, uh, who's there to criticize the government. I mean, I recently saw a clip of uh, a religious cleric saying, you know, if you build a mosque from U.S. donor money, uh, non-Muslims, then we should destroy the mosque and rebuild it with Afghan money. And the guy on the opposite side of the table said to him, well, uh, the Islamic Emirate, uh, which is the government the Taliban refer to themselves, uh, receives uh, um, um, a lot of donations and money through UN and other organizations uh, to stabilize the economy. Does that mean we need to destroy the economy and rebuild it from the start? Uh, I, I cite this example to say that it's a it's a very blurry situation when it comes to the media. We, we know some prominent critics of the government have been arrested uh, or, or interned for uh, days uh, at times by the Taliban, uh, in, including the intelligence, uh, uh, the Taliban's intelligence, the GDI or General Director of, of Intelligence. Other times you will see people making quite harsh criticism of the government and continue to do so uh, in the local media. So it's a bit of a, it, it's hard for me to define to give you know a safe uh, definition of this is what you can get away with when it comes to the media, but w I think it's a bit of a blurry line, and the challenge for a lot of ordinary Afghans is when do they cross that line, and where do right. they need to stop? Yeah, yeah. When it's when it's all gray, you don't really know what the what the new rules are. Um, there's a there's a question that's come in from Arashi Keen about. Uh, the recent killing of um, Al-Qaeda leader Zawahiri. Um, the question is, because he was found in Kabul, do the panel members see any chance for a new international intervention? I thought I would just uh, an answer this question quickly and see if others, uh, if Ibrahim or Graham, you have anything to add. My quick answer is no. I don't think this means there's any increased chance of an international intervention. To the contrary, I think from a Western perspective, this means uh, because the number one uh, loose end has now been snipped off uh, when it comes to counterterrorism interests in Afghanistan. I think it means it's less likely that there will be attention uh, in this area to Afghanistan rather than more likely. Um, but I'm wondering if either of you have any uh, differences of view with that. Yeah, I noticed um, after the killing of uh, Zawahiri, some of my friends who are associated with northern political factions immediately got in touch and wanted to know, you know, if this had sort of changed the strategic calculus and whether, you know, um, international actors might be interested now in giving, you know, guns or money to anti-Taliban factions. And um, despite the sort of flurry of questions, I had the same instinct that, you know, I, I, I thought the answer was no. Um, some Western officials have told me the answer is no. Um, but, you know, I think Ibrahim and I just published uh, an essay in, in foreign affairs, um, and we certainly got some of these talking points into the most recent report, just sort of saying, listen, um, just because something seems like a far-fetched bad idea doesn't necessarily mean it won't at some point be embraced by Western policymakers. So it's worth kind of reminding them that it would be a bad idea to start a new civil war. Um, and then, you know, from there, spooling out the um, policy alternatives, because, um, we don't think that it is a good idea to just ignore uh, the various security challenges uh, surrounding mm -hmm. Afghanistan um, and that maybe there are uh, ways of, you know, carefully and in a calibrated way um, engaging with the Taliban on, on security issues uh, as an alternative to taking unilateral action. Right. And I mean, I would just note the fact that Zawahiri was found in Afghanistan is not genuinely a new fact. I mean, it was already the assessment of Western governments openly uh, and others that there were remnants of Al Qaeda 
in Afghanistan and that Zawahiri was probably somewhere in Afghanistan. Now, perhaps it was a surprise that he was right there in the center of Kabul, but it, you know, I wouldn't expect the analysis of the problem or the policy about what to do about it to change materially uh, because of a specific location he was found. The fact is it was already known that this was a problem and now there's this most important loose end that has been uh, that has been cleaned up. Yeah, um, people people always yeah, ask me if people always ask me if we had to do last minute rewriting of the security report um, when Zawahiri was killed, and the answer was like actually not as much as you might expect because you know right. Ibrahim had already done voluminous research uh, on you know the sort of variety of militant groups, including uh, Al Qaeda, that, that do remain. All right. Um, there's an interesting question that's come in from Suzanne Schroeder that, uh, Ibri, maybe you can go first on this one. And it relates to some of the points that you, you already referenced uh, about the Taliban. The question is, for 10 years, we heard that the younger generation of Taliban fighters were more radical than their older counterparts who had fought the Soviets. Regarding the internal differences over girls' secondary education, how do these divisions break down along ideological and generational lines? And that's, you know, this is certainly an analysis that I had heard many times, this idea that the younger fighters uh, were more radical than the uh, older, uh, more senior people in the Taliban. And, you know, sometimes this was even a line that you would hear from Taliban figures as, a, you know, be careful, don't alienate us because we've got this younger cohort to manage and we don't want to alienate them. But I'm wondering, Ibrahim, uh, do you see that generational divide being real? Do you see it as something having uh, that has evolved over the last year? And does it relate to some specific policy decisions that the Taliban have made over the last year, in particular regarding girls' access to education? And uh, Let me try to answer that as briefly as I can, just because I can see uh, there's a lot of questions pouring in. Uh, I think the Taliban is a collection of individuals uh, from different backgrounds and different geographies and whatnot uh, do have uh, differing opinions. I think when it comes to uh, the Taliban, the older generation, when we want to look at it from a generational perspective, the older generation is more conservative uh, on the social spheres, whereas the younger generation is, uh, Afghanistan has changed over the last two decades. We have heard this time and again, and uh, the Taliban don't appear to be to have been immune to that change. A lot of the younger generation are socially more flexible compared to the older generation of the Taliban. At the same time, I think in terms of outlook, it is the older generation that has kept the Taliban firmly as a organization which has limits limited its ambitions to Afghanistan rather than having a globalist. I think if some of the younger generation had its way with it, perhaps the Taliban would not be this. We would not view the Taliban the same way we do today. It's because the older generation. Uh, perhaps with the benefit of hindsight and experience has decided that the Taliban as a movement will not be a transnational movement and it would be limited to Afghanistan. So I think the generational gap between the Taliban goes both ways in many different ways. That's interesting. Yeah, it's not, um, it's not clear cut. Uh, there's not a clear cut divide as to what does more conservative or what does more radical uh, mean. Thanks for that insight. Um, we've got a question from Piotr Kurzin. Uh, um, about um, Islamic State Khorasan uh, in Afghanistan, uh, referencing the attacks um, that have occurred, especially in the first uh, months of Taliban governance. But I think we've seen some, some uh, really tragic incidents since then as well. Um, could um, both of you speak a little bit about what the risk is from Islamic State Khorasan to the Taliban, both uh, from not just from a security perspective as a challenge they have to manage, but also from a governance perspective. And is there any connection here between the threat from ISK and the potential for Al Qaeda to regain influence? That's part of the question, whether there's any linkage there. Graham, do you want to try this one first and then over to Ibrahim? Yeah, Ibrahim's really the master here, so I'll try to be very short. But um, yeah, Piotr, hi, um, you, you raise a good point. Um, you know, and, and this is just something it goes back uh, since before ISKP existed in Afghanistan. I mean, the last time I was in those eastern mountains in Asadabad, it was, you know, uh, years ago, uh, almost a decade ago now, researching a, a crisis group report. And um, at that time, people told me stories about how the Taliban in the 1990s had a really hard time securing those far reaches of the eastern mountains because they faced uh, a lot of resistance from Salafists, mil Salafist militants. Um, you know, there are people there who just sort of fundamentally disagreed with the Taliban's view of Islam. 
And uh, so that's why, you know, when I've been reading Ibrahim's excellent analysis of the, you know, more recent situation with ISKP, I, I, I've just been sort of unsurprised, I guess, that the Taliban have struggled so hard. But uh, Ibrahim, why don't you uh, keep us up to date uh, on this uh, uh, thank you uh, for the excellent summary, Graham. Uh, I'll briefly uh, start off by saying uh, the security challenges report we've recently published kind of dives into this issue in more detail and looks at the strategy of uh, Islamic State Khorasan uh, and what's it trying to achieve. If I was to try to summarize it as briefly as I can, I would say uh, the Islamic State Khorasan really is attempting to place itself as the new challenger to the political order. And to do that, they are framing the Taliban as corrupted who have kind of made a deal with the US uh, in the Doha negotiations, where now they are protecting Washington from uh, Islam, pure Islamism, uh, uh, as it were. And I think that the strategy revolves around ensuring they survive any crackdown by the Taliban. And the Taliban have certainly cracked down very brutally when it comes to uh, the Islamic State, uh, but also attempting to uh, leech uh, any, anyone that's upset with the Taliban, whether it's Taliban young members uh, or, or commanders who might be upset with the direction of the government or the composition or personal reasons that they didn't get uh, a, a position commensurate with what they had done, or whether it's uh, other jihadist groups that are currently allied with the Taliban, whether it's Al-Qaeda, whether it's TTP. I, I think that's the long-term uh, game that uh, Islamic State is uh, posing. The Taliban have cracked down on it quite brutally. In some cases, they have uh, temporarily dismantled Islamic State in parts of the country, but uh, ISKP has proven a resilient uh, uh, opponent. And as Graham said, if we look at the ideological differences between the two, uh, this threat will likely continue for at least the medium term, if not the long term. Um, Al-Qaeda, uh, uh, it's difficult to say, but I think it will be a game changer if Al-Qaeda chooses the next leader who is not based in Afghanistan who, or who, who does, doesn't subsequently then come to Afghanistan to seek refuge. It might uh, rid of the Taliban. Uh, there's a famous saying attributed to Mullah Umar. I don't know if it's correct or not. Uh, Mullah Umar apparently said that Al-Qaeda is like a bone stuck in his throat. He can't spit it out and he can't swallow it. And I think if the leadership of Al-Qaeda, the top leadership was elected somewhere outside of Afghanistan, it might get rid of that fish fishbone with, with which the Taliban have struggled for nearly three decades now. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, we've got a, a, a comment, more of a comment than a question here, but I, I still want to um, surface this one from Zaman Sultani about um, disagreeing with the notion that the Taliban takeover has brought security. Um, and uh, the comment says it, it rather institutionalized fear, insecurity into the minds of women, children, men. In most cases, the Taliban soldiers act as police, prosecutor, judge. What, what security if people cannot find? So one thing I just want to say and then um, open it to you, Ibrahim, and then Graham, if there's anything you want to add is, you know, I do think it's, um, it's important to highlight that there are so many different experiences by different people. This is as true in Afghanistan as it is anywhere in the world. And, you know, what does security mean? What does order mean? What does stability mean? I mean, these are very contested concepts. I think I want to just be clear that when we're writing about how the security picture has changed in Afghanistan, you know, any of our sort of positive comments about that are about reduction in the level of violence. I mean, it is simply the, the, the matter of fewer people losing their lives. Um, I'll just say my, my own personal view is that there is inherent positivity in fewer people losing their lives and more people being able to till the soil, send their children who are allowed to go to school to school um, safely without to, to move about without um, fear of death. Now, that's not the only good that there is in society by any means. And I'm not I'm not purporting in any way to impose, you know, any of my own personal views on what others experiences are, what of what they value. But I just want to be clear that when we're talking about positive changes in the security picture, we're we're talking in a very um, simple and, you know, not to be simplistic about it, but simple way uh, about reduction in levels of violence and that that is important. But that's not to say that there aren't other uh, other aspects of the security picture and of people's daily lives that aren't extremely important as well. So um, Ibrahim and Graham, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that or, or, or comment on that comment. I mean, I think it's an important comment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, Crisis Group is a peace organization. And uh, this is something we struggle with in a lot of our work, because what is peace, after all? 
um, you know, and it, it's easy to get sort of lost in a complicated discussion of positive peace and negative peace. Um, I think it is still important uh, to count things because uh, when you count things, um, you're not just reducing people to statistics, you're actually putting value on human lives. Um, and so I think it's important to note that, you know, at the height of this conflict, it ranked as the deadliest conflict on the planet Earth. Uh, by one count, uh, 30,000, by another count, 40,000 uh, people dying per year directly in the conflict. Um, the UN numbers on displacement are also really, really important because in a bad month, we previously had upwards of 200,000 people displaced, forced to flee their homes because of the violence in a single month. And now, you know, uh, those numbers are way down, 1,000, 2,000, you know, uh, when things get hot in some of the um, northern mountains. So, you know, it's, um, we, we have to value all of these experiences. And certainly, um, you know, this is one of the reasons why we've been back on the ground, uh, hiring female researchers, why we're looking into the ways that, um, you know, the Taliban handle governance issues. Uh, for men, for women, for uh, ethnic minorities, for religious minority, minorities, for tribal minorities. You know, these things really do matter in the different ways that people uh, experience their country. But um, yeah, I think, um, you know, speaking personally, as someone who has been bombed and shot at and rocketed and mortared and RPG'd in Afghanistan, I, th I think it, it does feel different when uh, things aren't going bang like that. I don't know. Ibrahim, what do you think? Uh, thank you. Let me just add a few brief comments as well. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the sad reality is that Afghanistan has gone through decades of conflict and it has really polarized society. I think at the vanguard of the political class, we have two two different classes which all see themselves as ir irreconcilable with one another. On one hand, you have the vanguard of the Islamists who who are very much opposed to Western forms of governance. And then on the other hand, you have people who, who cherish the Western democratic heritage and want that uh, outlook for Afghanistan. And unfortunately, the sad reality is that every time one has been on top, the other has seen itself being persecuted. If you talk to many of the... Uh, you know, Taliban sympathizers in Kabul, some of whom were killed in unclaimed assassinations, others were arrested. They would they would talk to you about these security situations in a very different way. They would say, now there's security and freedom for them, but in the past they were persecuted. But on, on the flip side of the coin, of course, there's, uh, there was a political class in Kabul uh, and, and, and parts of Afghanistan, many parts of Afghanistan, which has now, which is now the one being persecuted. So it's not to, uh, as Laurel pointed out, uh, when we talk about better security, we are not uh, diminishing the suffering that many of these people face, uh, but it's to admit that there is a level of violence in the country, the, 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 the amount of bombs and bullets going off in the country, they have reduced. Uh, I'll say that a lot of the time when I speak to locals in Afghanistan, particularly outside the of Kabul in the provinces, uh, to be perfectly honest, you don't hear them delving into political systems. This is better or that is better. They, they generally will see the any government, whether when you ask them to compare the current government with the previous, they would talk about it in a sense of a distance, remote capital that is unaware of their local problems. Uh, so it's not, uh, I don't think in Afghanistan, outside the capital of Kabul, there is a lot of uh, concern with the political type of system. The, people just want the government to give them enough facilitation so that they can go about their lives. Uh, but let me just end again by saying what Laurel said, that you know, when we talk about security, we mean a very specific thing rather than saying that there is an injustice going on in Afghanistan right now. Yeah. I mean, and of course, it's always true that the vast majority of the population is not in any form of the political class. But uh, they're the ones who suffer from that kind of contestation between the alternative versions of what's the superior political class. Um, we've, we've got a question about TTP here. Um, Tariq Taliban, uh, Pakistan, the Pakistani Taliban, uh, and the, how we look at the Taliban hosting uh, TTP. Um, of course, there was some, uh, let's just say, um, uh, allowing of TTP presence in Afghanistan by the previous government too. Uh, so it's uh, not necessarily a new thing uh, for, uh, for Afghan authorities of whatever stripe to be trying to use their relationships with, uh, with TTP in different ways vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. But under the, the current dispensation, um, the question is, how do we look at the Taliban hosting the TTP? What does this mean in terms of relations with, um, with Pakistan 
Uh, and uh, the specific question here is whether it means that the Taliban are violating the Doha deal, but I think maybe to speak a little more broadly about this would be interesting. What does it mean in terms of uh, the Taliban's relationships with both the West and with Pakistan, that it's now quite open that they are uh, enabling TTP to be present in Afghanistan? Ibrahim, do you want to go first? Um, because the question is addressed to you, Laurel, I'm quite happy for you to answer it. I was being very, <laughs> I was cleverly working around the fact that it was addressed to me. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I will just say, you know, to me, questions as to whether they, the Taliban are technically violating the Doha deal or not are not particularly relevant. Uh, if, if any, if the United States finds it convenient to say that they're violating the Doha deal because that reinforce, reinforces a policy message, then they will say that. But um, there, there's no uh, enforcement of the Doha deal that is feasible. And so it's not, I don't think it's particularly relevant to U.S. policymaking, whether this is a technically a violation or not. But I do think there's some interesting points as to what does this mean in terms of, uh, in terms of Taliban relationships uh, relationship with Pakistan, an obviously important neighbor. Over to you, Ibrahim. Uh, thank you. Uh, on the Doha deal, uh, I think the Doha deal has been, uh, it's been accompanied by incrimination since the day it was signed. Uh, the Taliban also complained that, you know, uh, the U.S. hasn't fulfilled their part of the bargain. I was listening to Zalma Khalilzad where he said both parties haven't actually fulfilled the deal. Uh, the U.S. promised to remove sanctions from Taliban leaders. Uh, and uh, uh, recently, Anas Haqqani was giving an interview where he was, uh, the Doha agreement came up and he said, well, the U.S. unilaterally extended the deadline, they delayed the prison releases and whatnot. And I mean, the Taliban CT breaches of the, uh, the Doha agreement are quite clear to everyone. I think no matter how you interpret it, no matter how flexibly you interpret the Doha agreement, it, it, it couldn't conceivably justify having uh, Zawahiri in Kabul, presuming that the Taliban were aware of uh, him being Kabul, which uh, on the face of it does look like was the case. Uh, in terms of uh, what it means uh, for, uh, for the relationships between Pakistan and Taliban, I, I think uh, Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan face a number of uh, issues, some of which are historical. Uh, the border uh, uh, between the two countries has always been a, a bone of contention between the two. And recently we have seen, since the Taliban have come to power, we have seen some of these border clashes f uh, flaring up uh, at times at over the fencing. Recently we saw in Badakhshan uh, where the Taliban kind of pushed back Taliban, Pakistani security forces because they believed they had impeached on what was uh, they considered to be Afghan land. Then you have the challenge of the TTP, uh, TTP of, uh, I think on the face of it, again, I would say I, I want to use, be a bit cautious and kind of give a bit of benefit of the doubt when I'm making these claims. But uh, the TTP appears to be quite active in Afghanistan and since the Taliban's takeover uh, appears to have rejuvenated and uh, it's caused serious security challenges for Pakistan. On the other hand, when you do speak with the Taliban, a lot of the time they will uh, make the opposite claim. They, they will say that ISKP is being you know, uh, uh, it's coming. It's a threat coming across the border. I think the Taliban officials uh, publicly have hinted at this uh, several times, and privately, very openly, do say that they they, they think that uh, ISKP might be uh, the Pakistan might be using it as a leverage uh, against Afghanistan, and that's why they uh, they they want to keep TTP uh, as a leverage as well. The other big challenge is. TTP, uh, ISKP was formed historically from TTP members, and I think the Taliban are very, uh, the relationships between these two groups in some ways persist and ideologies are sufficiently aligned, although the two on the opposite end of the spectrum, one's allied with the Taliban, the other's fighting it. But I think the Taliban are fearful that if they push the TTP too hard, uh, it will cause many, uh, a lot of them to defect. I do apologize, I think I'm going over the time limit, so I'm going to stop there. No worries, no worries. No, that's really helpful uh, analysis and insights there, so. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to turn to Graham for the last question uh, that we will uh, consider here. We've got one in that refers to the U.S. Um, blockage of $7 billion in foreign assets that had belonged to Afghanistan's central, banks, uh, central bank. And the question is uh, specifically referring to a recent Wall Street Journal article about the uh, seizure of those assets and uh, reported suspension of U.S. talks with the Taliban 
over the disposition of those funds after the killing of al-Qaeda leader uh, Zawahiri in Kabul. Um, Graham, uh, this is a topic that you have been following closely, the question uh, to do with those frozen assets and whether there's any way to negotiate the release of at least some of them in order to restore functionality of the Afghan Central Bank. Uh, and I know you've been following closely the U.S. Taliban talks about that. So over to you for any comments on that. Yeah. So as I said at the beginning of this uh, conversation, um, you know, Crisis Group put out a report in December urging the international community to ease some of the economic restrictions uh, on Afghanistan in order to, to help with recovery. Um, and one of those key recommendations we made uh, was that there should be a, a sort of a phased unfreezing of the uh, more than $9 billion, actually, in um, central bank reserves that are held internationally, um, seven of those in the United States and about two in Europe. And um, of all the recommendations we made, that's the one that's been, um, I think, the hardest for the United States and its allies to put into motion. Um, there have been these ongoing negotiations that you alluded to, um, led by uh, the U.S. State Department um, in conversation primarily with the Afghanistan banks, the Central Bank of Afghanistan, and also with the Taliban-controlled uh, foreign ministry. And um, those talks have been frustrating, I think, for both sides. Um, the Taliban are essentially saying, what right do you have to freeze this money um, you know, back to the Central Bank? And um, the American position is that, look, this is not the Taliban's money. Um, we don't have a lot of confidence in the you know, sort of technocratic capacity now of the central bank after a bunch of the officials uh, evacuated. And um, you know, the Americans say they are very concerned about the anti-money laundering and um, you know, the, the capacity of the office within the central bank that was meant to counter the financing of terrorism, for example. Um, and those concerns have deepened after uh, the recent discovery of Zawahiri living on the Taliban's doorstep in Kabul. Um, that being said, um, you know, after the Zawahiri killing, um, state and treasury officials have told us that those uh, talks are still on. Um, they still have hope um, to create some kind of a mechanism where the central bank funds could be deposited into some form of a trust fund or other uh, holding mechanism, possibly in Switzerland. Um, and that that would allow for the slow rehabilitation of the central bank, which is so vital to making sure that the, the currency has value, making sure that there's enough cash liquidity for imports. I mean, these are the nuts and bolts of how Afghans eat. And that is very important when you're talking about a population, half of which uh, is on the brink of starvation, according to the UN, you know, 20 million people on the brink of starvation. So, you know, these very complicated discussions about, you know, macroeconomic stability you know, are actually life or death for ordinary Afghans, especially as we get into the winter. And uh, there's a lot of frustration, as I say, on, on both sides. I think uh, with respect to my friends, Jess and Margay from the Wall Street Journal, they might have slightly misunderstood. Um, in fact, uh, in the last hour, I think I've confirmed that their uh, story is not entirely correct because they're quoting uh, U.S. envoy Tom West saying that the $7 billion held by the United States will not be returned uh, to the Afghan Central Bank, but that's really not what's under discussion. What's what's under discussion, or at least being proposed by the American side, is uh, putting the money in some kind of uh, uh, safekeeping in Europe uh, and using it to gradually uh, bring the central bank back to life. So it's complicated, but it's um, it, it, the stuff is really vital to um, uh, to getting the Afghan economy back on its feet, and, and we'll continue to follow it. Thanks, Graham. And thanks for bringing this back to that really crucial point that you started with, which is um, the really devastating economic and humanitarian situation in Afghanistan and, uh, and the need uh, for continued focus on that and attention um, by Afghan authorities foremost and by the international community as well to doing whatever they can to restore economic activity and ensure that uh, people have food to eat, um, the basics of life. Uh, I want to thank you, um, Ibrahim and Graham, for uh, your really excellent comments here today and answers to questions. And thank all the listeners and especially those who submitted um, really good and thoughtful questions here. I'm sorry we weren't, be able, we weren't able to get to all of them, uh, but we got to as many as we could. And I just want to let everyone know that a recording of this Twitter space will be available on Twitter. So if you uh, came in partway through and you want to listen to the beginning, it will be available there. Uh, and do feel free to let others know about its availability. 
Um, thanks again. And we'll look forward to hosting another one of these soon. Bye, everyone.